Bargy. Good evening. It's Thursday, July 22nd. COVID cases in the country nearly tripling in the last two weeks. As the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention reports, over a 50% increase in the last week alone. Republican politicians under increasing pressure to speak out, to persuade COVID-19 vaccine skeptics to roll up their sleeves and take the shots. As the new, more contagious Delta variant sends cases loads soaring. Three Bay Area counties, San Francisco, Contra Costa, and Santa Clara, urge employers to require their workers be vaccinated before returning to work. Vice President Kamala Harris meets with Dreamers, DACA recipients, undocumented immigrants brought to the U.S. as children, and calls on Congress to pass immigration reform. The state of Texas starts enforcing its own immigration laws as it starts to arrest migrants on trespassing charges along the U.S.-Mexico border. The Biden administration announces new sanctions against a Cuban official and a government special brigade that it says was involved in human rights abuses during a government crackdown on protests on the island earlier this month. And the University of California regents approve a multi-year plan to raise tuition and fees, the first increase in four years. From Pacifica Radio, KPFA in Berkeley, KPFK in Los Angeles, this is the Evening News. I'm Mark Miracle. New coronavirus cases surged 53% higher last week over the previous one as the Delta variant spreads. That's according to the disease for the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. This comes as states with low vaccination rates are beginning to report an uptick in inoculations. KPFA's Alyssa Martinet reports. Across the U.S., daily new cases rose over the past two weeks to more than 37,000, up from less than 13,700 on July 6, according to data from Johns Hopkins University. CDC, Centers for Disease Control and Prevention Director Rochelle Walensky, says there were 46,000 new reported coronavirus infections yesterday alone. She pointed to the transmissibility of the Delta variant as a leading cause. The Delta variant is spreading with incredible efficiency and now represents more than 83% of the virus circulating in the United States. Compared to the virus we had circulating initially in the United States at the start of the pandemic, the Delta variant is more aggressive and much more transmissible than previously circulating strains. It is one of the most infectious respiratory viruses we know of and that I have seen in my 20-year career. Just 56% of Americans have gotten at least one dose of a vaccine, according to the CDC. White House Task Force Coordinator Jeff Zients said the largest number of cases are occurring in regions with the lowest vaccination rates. Unvaccinated individuals account for virtually all, 97%, of the COVID hospitalizations and deaths in the U.S. In fact, the counties with the highest case rates have significantly lower vaccination rates than counties with lower case rates. This week, just three states, Florida, Texas, and Missouri, three states with lower vaccination rates, accounted for 40% of all cases nationwide. In places like Arkansas, Florida, Louisiana, Missouri, and Nevada, where opposition to the vaccine is prevalent, the messaging is changing. In Missouri, 200 pastors and ministers have signed a statement urging Christians to get the COVID-19 vaccination in a concerted effort to beat back against misinformation driving vaccine hesitancy. COVID-19 infections have nearly tripled in the past two weeks, and vaccination rates have been slowing. Surgeon General Vivek Murthy partly blames the onslaught of vaccine misinformation, which is straining hospitals and exhausting doctors. And we have continued to emphasize what individuals can do to stop health misinformation in its tracks. That includes asking everyone to raise their own bar for sharing health information 
by checking to make sure that it's backed by credible scientific sources. As we say in the advisory, if you are not sure, don't share. Dr. Murthy issued a Surgeon General's advisory to combat health misinformation last week. He says conversations with trusted community members can help convince vaccine-hesitant people to get the shot. Recent data finds that one out of five adults who were unsure about the vaccine in January have now been vaccinated. And when asked what changed their mind, it was talking to family, friends, and their doctors, and seeing that people they knew had been safely vaccinated. So we need to keep having these conversations. Although health officials are warning the U.S. is at another critical juncture in the pandemic, the CDC has not changed its guidance that vaccinated people no longer need to wear masks. For KPFA News, I'm Melissa Martinet. Republican politicians are under increasing pressure to speak out to persuade COVID-19 vaccine skeptics to roll up their sleeves and get inoculated as the new, more contagious Delta variant sends caseloads soaring across the country. But after months of ignoring and in some cases stoking misinformation about the virus, experts are warning it may be too late to change the minds of many who are refusing. In recent news conferences and statements, some prominent Republicans have been imploring their constituents to lay lingering doubts aside. In Washington, the so-called Doctors Caucus gathered at the Capitol for an event to combat vaccine hesitancy. And in Florida, Republican Governor Ron DeSantis this week pointed to data showing the vast majority of hospitalized COVID-19 patients had not received shots. These vaccines are saving lives, said DeSantis, who recently began selling campaign merchandise, mocking masks and medical experts. For months now, many conservative lawmakers and pundits have been actively stoking vaccine hesitancy, refusing to take the shots themselves or downplaying the severity of the virus. Republican governors have signed bills protecting the unvaccinated from having to disclose their status and try to roll back mask mandates. And on social media, disinformation has run rampant, leading President Biden to claim platforms like Facebook are killing people. At a recent right-wing gathering, attendees cheered the news that the Biden administration was falling short of its vaccination goals. Invoking the nation's top infectious disease expert, Dr. Anthony Fauci, Congresswoman Lauren Robert, Republican of Colorado, warned the government, don't come knocking on my door with your Fauci ouchie. You leave us the hell alone. There was more today at our news conference convened by House Republican leaders in Washington. Initially billed as an event where Republican doctors in Congress would address the rapidly spreading Delta variant, the group instead spent most of its time railing against China and making unverified claims that the coronavirus came from a lab leak in Wuhan, a theory initially popular in far-right circles but now being seriously considered by some scientists. They also attacked Democrats, including House Speaker Pelosi and the Biden administration, for not doing more to get to the bottom of the lab leak theory. Representative Marjorie Taylor Greene, Republican from Georgia, was suspended from posting on Twitter for 12 hours earlier this week after spreading disinformation about vaccine-related deaths. And Charlie Kirk, the founder of Turning Point USA, popular youth conservative advocacy group that last weekend hosted a conference that drew former Secretary of State Mike Pompeo and numerous members of Congress suggested without any evidence on his podcast that up to 1.2 million could have died after getting the COVID-19 vaccine. The refusal of such a huge percentage of the population to get inoculated is increasingly driving public health officials to return to masks in an attempt to control the disease. More from reporter Sarah Walton. The average number of new COVID-19 cases per day in the United States jumped by 55% in the last seven days, according to data compiled by John Hopkins University. Experts say it's being driven by the more infectious Delta variant of the virus. 
New cases more than doubled in the state of Mississippi, where just 34% of people are fully vaccinated, one of the lowest vaccination rates in the country. The Washington Post is reporting that the White House could soon ask everyone to start wearing face masks once again, while the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention is also considering updating its guidance. Meanwhile, some local officials across the country have already reintroduced mask mandates as a precaution. I'm Sarah Walton in New York. Missouri's Republican Governor Mike Parson has rolled out a vaccine incentive program that includes $10,000 in prizes for 900 lottery winners. Missouri lacks lags about 10 percentage points behind the national average for people who have initiated shots. Parsons said the goal of the incentive program is to ramp up Missouri's current 40 percent vaccination rate. We encourage all Missourians to consider getting vaccinated as almost all new COVID hospitalizations can be attributed to unvaccinated individuals. Rural parts of the state have particularly low vaccination rates. Opposition to vaccination, especially strong among white evangelical Protestants, who make up more than one-third of Missouri's residents. New York City Mayor Bill de Blasio said workers in city-run hospitals and health clinics will be required to get vaccinated or to get tested weekly. As officials battle a rise in COVID-19 cases there, de Blasio's order will not apply to teachers police officers and other city employees, but as part of the city's intense focus on vaccinations amid the increase in Delta variant infections. In Michigan, health officials are prioritizing equity as they continue to urge more residents to get vaccinated against COVID-19. Lily Bolke reports. Dr. Joni Khaldun, Michigan's chief medical executive, points out that while more than 40% of white Michiganders have been fully vaccinated, meaning it's been two weeks since their last dose, that number is much lower among the state's black population. Just around 30% of black residents are fully protected. So we're working with churches, neighborhood-based organizations, um, social service organizations to make sure we are bringing vaccines into neighborhoods. These vaccines are available and accessible, and that's something that we have prioritized across the state. Khaldun adds that for some black communities and communities of color, there's distrust of the healthcare and medical research systems because of historical discrimination and abuse. She wants people to know that these vaccines are effective and proven to be safe. Aurora Saucida works with Michigan United in Flint. She says some people don't have access or don't know how to use the internet to make a vaccine appointment, especially older residents. And others don't speak English as their primary language and have trouble accessing information about the vaccines. She adds that lack of transportation and ability to take time off work have been additional barriers for some people. All the people that wanted to come and get it and were you know, anxious to get it have gotten it. Now it's reaching out to those that are still waiting for somebody to tell them something about the vaccine or still aren't fully convinced that the vaccine is a protection to them. Health officials in Michigan also were urging parents of 12 to 15 year olds to prioritize getting them their vaccines. So far, about a quarter of Michigan teens younger than 16 have been fully vaccinated. This is Lily Bolke for Michigan News Connection. Los Angeles County health officials report more than 2,500 new COVID-19 infections in their latest update, the largest daily number since mid-February. 2,551 infections reported yesterday marked the 13th consecutive day that the number has topped 1,000. The number of people hospitalized due to the virus continued to climb, jumping to 645 yesterday, according to state figures. The number of people in intensive care rose to 140. Los Angeles County implemented a renewed mask-wearing mandate late Saturday requiring face coverings in all indoor public settings regardless of vaccination status. Three Bay Area counties are urging employers to require their workers be vaccinated before returning on site. That comes as California reports more than 5,000 new COVID-19 infections in the last 24 hours. Adesian M&J reports. 
Bay Area public health experts are encouraging workers to get vaccinated as coronavirus infections rise due to the Delta variant. Dr. George Hahn, Santa Clara Deputy Health Officer, says requiring documentation of vaccine status, vaccination as a condition of employment, and additional safety precautions are just some of the steps workplaces can take to make a safer work environment. The health officers of Contra Costa, Santa Clara, and San Francisco counties strongly urge all employers to consider implementing workplace COVID-19 safety protocols that require their workforce to get fully vaccinated as soon as possible. We know that vaccines are the best tool that we have uh, to combat COVID-19 and they are safe and effective even in the context of the Delta variant. Uh, which is now the predominant variant in the country and in California. The push comes as California is reporting 5,557 new infections in the last 24 hours and 31 deaths. The fact that COVID test positivity is increasing while hospitalization is decreasing is a known California trend among the vaccinated. San Francisco Deputy Director of Health says being unvaccinated is not an option. It puts older working adults and kids in need of in-classroom education at risk. Members of the public whom workers interact with are also at risk. In San Francisco, we've seen almost an eight to tenfold increase in our case rates and test positivity is also increasing. And while hospitalizations um, are increasing at a slower rate, um, they are something that we're very concerned about. This trend is not unique to San Francisco. The Bay Area and California are all seeing the same trend. Um, with Delta, it's not, it's, we need people to be vaccinated. It's not time to be unvaccinated. The time right now is to ensure that you do get the vaccine. One where our collective and swift action can change the course of the pandemic for good and save lives. Spreading COVID-19 in the workplace also puts a strain on business and other workers who fall sick and miss time from work due to the quarantining or hospital stays. According to a report from the UC Berkeley School of Public Health and Petra Center, health care costs due to COVID-19 in California were $2.4 billion. Dr. Chris Fonartano is Contra Costa's country's public health officer. And unvaccinated workers pose a risk not only to themselves, but also to their co-workers and the members of the public they interact with. Now, employers have an obligation to provide safe workplaces for their employees. Uh, so this is something that employers and workers should be able to agree on. There are key steps that employers can take to create uh, COVID safe workplaces. Most importantly, requiring vaccination of their workforce um, and allowing only very limited um, legally required exceptions. The choice now is either to get the vaccine or to get COVID. Dr. Farnartano advises only limited exceptions should allow unvaccinated workers on site. He says higher quality masks and regular testing are just some of the key steps to create COVID safe workplaces. So the importance for everyone wearing a mask indoors in workplaces is highly recommended. Amadeze Nejime reporting for KPFA. The Prime Minister of France is confirming that the country's new COVID certificate will now be required for any leisure activity where more than 50 people are gathered. Simon Marks has that story. Today, the efforts by President Emmanuel Macron to force people in France to get vaccinated against COVID-19. He is going further than any other leader of a liberal democracy to warn French citizens that they have responsibilities if they want to continue enjoying the fruits of the country's liberties. And principal among them is getting vaccinated. As of yesterday, no one in France can enter a museum or a cinema unless they have proof of vaccination or a negative COVID test. Next month, restaurants and cafes will be similarly regulated. Catherine Hill is an epidemiologist with the Gustave Ruissi Institute in Paris. It's leading many people to get appointment to get vaccinated. And we are seeing the proportion of people that are vaccinated increasing every day, which is very good. And another good news is among the 18,000 positive tests found yesterday, I think, people with positive tests yesterday, 96% were unvaccinated. So the virus is circulating among the unvaccinated. And this is another incentive for the people to go and get vaccinated. And they're getting the message, which is good. There have been protests by people complaining that the president's actions are inhibiting personal freedoms. And it remains to be seen just how seriously the government plans to implement the tough love approach. With FSN Spotlight, I'm Simon Marks. Coronavirus cases are sweeping across Australia as the infectious Delta variant has taken hold. The capital of New South Wales, Sydney, seeing rising cases despite a four-week lockdown. 
Sean Bindley has the story. A record 85,185 people were tested in the state yesterday. There are now 118 people with COVID in hospital and 28 of them are in intensive care. Ms Berejiklian says with the infection being passed amongst friends and families, it's of the utmost importance that people stay at home. I can't stress enough how distressing it is for us when we uncover entire families who've got the virus, who've unknowingly or, or unwittingly given it to their extended family members. Households on households of loved ones just from one worker or one person bringing it home to the rest of their families. The strongest message we can give everybody at this time is please stay at home. In Brisbane, I'm Sean Bindley. And you're listening to the Evening News on KPFA Berkeley, KPFK Los Angeles, KFCF Fresno, online, kpfa.org. And here's the problem. We are one-third of the way through this hour-long newscast, and I have yet to ask for your financial support. That's because my main priority here is to bring you the news and as much of the material that I feel is warranted for your attention, but I have a secondary obligation to raise money to continue to be able to fund the effort to bring you that news and to put it on the air and broadcast it out. That is because this radio station, in case you haven't heard, does not have any commercials. Unlike many of the larger public radio stations, it does not have Corporate underwriting, which sound a lot like commercials, but technically are not. We don't have any religious organization funding this organization. We don't have a foundation of left, right, or center, or think tank thereof funding this broadcast operation. There are no gobs of rich people knocking on our door trying to give us money to stay on the air. We have to earn our keeps, so to speak, listener by listener, because nine out of every ten dollars that keep this radio station on the air come directly from you, the listener, and nearly all of that comes when we directly ask you over the airwaves during these fun drives to make a contribution in order to keep us going. 90%. We are three days into the fun drive here at this radio station. We've raised about one-sixth of the amount that we need to have when this fun drive ends in a total of 10 days. So if you do a quick mathematical calculation, or you can take my word for it, we're kind of behind, and we're falling further behind, and this newscast has to be held at least partly responsible for this mediocre showing thus far, because our showing has more or less stunk up the joint. We have been unable to reach either of our goals in our first two attempts, Tonight, our goal is to raise $1,500. If you are listening in Southern California, you can help us get to that goal by going online at kpfk.org or calling 818-985-5735. kpfk.org, and if you go there, you can see the multitudinous, the plethora of incentives that there are to make a financial donation. Or you can directly call us at 1-818-985-5735, 818-985-5735 or kpfk.org. If you're in Northern and Central California, go to kpfa.org and there you will find a myriad number of incentives to make a financial donation. That's at kpfa.org or call 1-800-439-5732. 1-800-439-5732. We're behind here. You can help us start to 
catch up with your financial donation tonight. KPFK.org in Southern California, 818-985-5735. KPFA.org in Northern and Central California, 1-800-439-5732. And now back to the main event, which is the newscast. We hope you got the message. You'll make the call or go online and make the donation. The Tamarack Fire south of Lake Tahoe has crossed into Nevada, prompting new evacuations. It's burned more than 68 square miles of timber and head-high chaparral in National Forest land. It erupted on July 4th, was one of nearly two dozen blazes sparked by lightning strikes. More than 1,200 firefighters are battling the Alpine County blaze, which has destroyed at least 10 buildings, forced evacuations in several communities, and had closed parts of U.S. 395 in Nevada and California. Fire officials expected active or extreme fire behavior today when they were expecting that they could see 14-mile-an-hour winds and temperatures approaching 90 degrees. A request for voluntary evacuations was also issued for portions of Douglas County, Nevada. The nation's largest wildfire, Oregon's bootleg blaze, grew to 618 square miles, just over half the size of the state of Rhode Island. However, authorities said lower winds and temperatures allowed crews to improve fire lines. The fire also was approaching an area burned by a previous fire on its active southeastern flank, raising hopes that the lack of fuel could reduce its spread. That blaze, which is being fought by more than 2,200 people, is about a third contained. More and more environmental scientists are saying you can't log your way out of the nation's forest fire problems. But that's just what the current version of the infrastructure bill, under consideration by the Congress, proposes to do. Roz Brown reports. The infrastructure bill would include billions in funding for the U.S. Forest Service in the name of wildfire prevention. Dominique de la Sala is a forest ecologist and an evacuee of last year's wildfire in Talent, Oregon. He says increasingly the term wildfires is a misnomer because they become urban fires that are destroying unprepared communities. Every dollar spent in the backcountry logging forests is a dollar that is not being spent assisting communities in hardening their homes around new climate fire reality. Della Sala says efforts to protect communities should be pursued rather than adding money to the infrastructure bill for logging activities and vegetation clearing. The bill, which includes the logging provisions, was introduced by West Virginia Senator Joe Manchin. Laura Height, with the Partnership for Policy Integrity, argues the Manchin provisions to allow more commercial logging activities would make the fire situation in the West worse, not better. She says Congress should be listening to scientists, not logging companies, about prevention. And what science has shown over and over and over again is that the areas where they do more of the logging are thinner and drier and much more prone to catastrophic wildfire. Della Sala says drought, heat waves and high winds brought on by deforestation and fossil fuel emissions could make 2021 the worst fire season ever. He believes policymakers need to be doing more to keep communities safe as fires caused by climate change increase. And that's not what we're seeing in this bill in Congress right now, which is going to put billions of dollars into additional logging in the backcountry that's only going to feed back in more future fires. He adds a disaster aid, relocation location assistance and proper planning should be the focus of lawmakers to make sure other communities are not destroyed when wildfires burn structures in a domino effect ignited by embers cast for miles ahead of the flames. For Oregon News Service, I'm Roz Brown. Find our eight trust indicators to support transparency and accuracy at publicnewsservice.org. Pacific Gas and Electric's recently hired new CEO, Patty Puppy, has announced the utility plans to bury 10,000 miles of its power lines in an effort to prevent its equipment from sparking more wildfires. The latest blaze apparently caused by PG&E equipment is the <coughs> Dixie Fire in Butte County. We are committing today to undertake one of the largest infrastructure projects in the history of our state. We are committing to bury 10,000 miles of lines. 
starting in our highest fire threat districts and our highest risk areas. We start today. Poppy said the utility was going to wait to make the announcement for a couple more months when it had plans more fully developed, but the Dixie Blaze prompted it to act sooner. Since it started on July 13th in a remote area of Butte County, the Dixie fires churned northeast through the Sierra Nevada. By yesterday, the fire spanned a 133 square mile forcing the Plumas County Sheriff to order evacuations along the west shore of popular Lake Almodor. Previous PG&E leaders have staunchly resisted plans to bury long stretches of power lines because of the massive expense involved. But Poppy said that she quickly realized after she joined PG&E in January that moving lines underground it's the best way to protect both the utility and the 16 million people who rely on it for power. It will be a lengthy process. In the few areas where PG&E has already been burying power lines, it's been completing about 70 miles each year. Chief Operating Officer Adam Wright said the utility eventually plans to be able to underground 1,000 miles of power lines a year. Undergrounding is tried and true. We've already done it in the past. What's different and unique about this situation is the scale and the scope. It's truly unprecedented and extraordinary. It hasn't been done at this scope or scale anywhere else in any other energy company in this terrain, and we're fully committed to achieving it. This will be a Marshall Plan-like effort. The projected cost is $15 billion to $30 billion, and most of that expense will likely be shouldered by PG&E customers whose electricity rates are already among the highest in the country. A Senate committee is deadlocked on President Biden's pick to oversee vast government-owned lands in the West. But Democrats are vowing to push on with the nomination of Tracy Stone Manning to head the Bureau of Land Management. Republicans have sought to undermine the credibility of the Bureau of Land Management nominee over her ties to a 32-year-old criminal investigation. Stone Manning received immunity to testify against two friends who were convicted in the 1989 sabotage of a national forest timber sale in Idaho. Wyoming Republican Senator John Barrasso. In 1989, while a grad student in Montana, Tracy Stone Manning collaborated with eco-terrorists who had hammered hundreds of metal spikes into trees in a national forest. But West Virginia Democrat and committee chair Joe Manchin said no evidence had emerged to indicate Stone Manning committed any sort of crime. We know who spiked the trees. Four men admitted not only their personal guilt, but identified the other three as their only accomplices. Ms. Stone Manning was never charged with spiking trees. She was never tried for spiking trees. And none of the men who did spike the trees ever suggested that she did. Nor was she a target in the investigation, despite being one of many to provide evidence in the investigation. Majority Leader Chuck Schumer said he would call for a vote on her nomination before the full Senate, where Vice President Kamala Harris could break a tie for her confirmation. You're listening to the evening news on KPFA in Berkeley, KPFK in Los Angeles, KFCF Fresno online, kpfa.org. It's an hour long newscast airing each night at six. I'm Mark Miracle, and we are trying to meet our financial goal for this newscast in terms of fundraising for the first time in this fund drive, trying to raise $1,500 to keep this newscast on the air. If you're getting something out of this newscast or other news and information that these radio stations bring to you. We're asking you to make a financial pledge at 818-985-5735. That's the phone number in Southern California, 818-985-5735, or going to KPFK's website at kpfk.org. If you are listening, Central Northern California, KPFA. Dot org is the website, kpfa.org, or calling 1-800-439-5732, 1-800-439-5732. If you go to the websites, you can see 
many, many incentives for you to make a financial donation and get something back. Thank you, gifts. KPFK.org, Southern California. KPFA.org, Northern and Central California. Immigrant rights activists are calling for congressional action after a Texas court ruled the DACA program illegal. The Obama-era Deferred Action for Childhood Arrivals program gives undocumented residents protections from deportation and the right to work if they were brought to the United States as children. Vice President Kamala Harris met with some youths known as the Dreamers who are affected by the ruling. Democratic leaders are vowing to take action in Congress. Christopher Martinez reports. Vice President Kamala Harris welcomed a group of dreamers to the office of the vice president, telling them the topic of their conversation would be the future of the United States. That really is the topic. That truly is the topic. The topic of our conversation is the topic of who are we as a country and the future of our country. The meeting comes six days after a federal district court judge in Texas declared the DACA program illegal because it violated the Administrative Procedures Act. The ruling does not affect the more than 600,000 DREAMers who are already in the program and thus protected from deportation and allowed to work. But it does block the program from accepting new applicants. Harris says she and President Biden will fight for a path to citizenship. But our administration is taking action. So through the United States Department of Justice, we have announced our intention to appeal the decision. And that is in process. And the Department of Homeland Security has announced that it will propose a new rule concerning DACA, which is very important because that's about the enforcement piece. One of the undocumented youths that met with Harris was 18-year-old Diana Bautista of Los Angeles. She says she could not apply for DACA because then-President Trump halted the program a month before she became eligible. She thought things changed when Trump's action was later overturned in court. I was able to apply in December 2020, and I paid the $800 filing and processing fee happily. I feel like this is finally my opportunity. This is my time. My application was in processing for six months. Then I went in for my biometrics. But the program was suddenly and cruelly canceled again last week because of a judge's order. That afternoon, I learned that my DACA application would not be approved. Although I am eligible for the program, I paid my dues. I waited my turn. I was let down again. This time by conservative forces that don't know me or my journey. Bautista says immigrants have kept the economy going through the pandemic, and she's calling on Congress to show up for them by passing immigration reform. On Wednesday, Democratic congressional leaders held their own news conference on immigration solutions alongside business, religious, and other leaders. Democrat Chuck Schumer of New York is the Senate majority leader. He blasted the Texas court ruling against DACA. So when I heard... That court decision on DACA, that vicious, brutal court decision on DACA. I was furious. I was frustrated. Another slap in the face to my 26,000 DACA recipients in New York and the 600,000 nationwide, not to mention thousands of others who were caught up in the bureaucratic mess left by the Trump administration uh, when Biden was starting to clean up. We cannot, cannot, must not, will not. Let the future of these DACA recipients hang in the balance. So rest assured, my friends, we are going to do everything we can to provide a pathway to citizenship for the Dreamers and many others. The House of Representatives has already passed a bill called the American Dream and Promise Act, and President Joe Biden called on Congress to pass it the day after the Texas ruling. But it has little chance of surviving a likely Republican filibuster in the Senate. Some advocates are calling for a similar measure to be put into a budget reconciliation bill that could pass without Republican votes. Republican strategist and CNN commentator Ana Navarro gave her opinion at the news conference as a heavy rain started to pour. We need to find a vehicle to do this, hopefully a bipartisan vehicle. But whether it is reconciliation, whether it is a bill, whether it is a Tesla or a Mack truck, we need to find a a vehicle because it's too damn long that we have held these young people hostage for political purposes. Let's get this done. Reporting for Pacifica Radio News, KPFA, I'm Christopher Martinez. Texas is beginning to arrest migrants on trespassing charges along the U.S.-Mexico border. 
Authorities said today that at least 10 people have been jailed so far and more expected in the coming weeks. The arrests are part of Republican Governor Greg Abbott's actions that he says are needed to slow the number of border crossings. He has also said he would continue building former President Trump's border wall, called on other governors to deploy law enforcement to the southern border. Valverde County District Attorney David Martinez says all of those arrested so far have been single adult men. He says it's his understanding that state troopers would not be arresting anyone arriving as part of a family unit. California Senator Alex Padilla chaired a Senate hearing on what he describes as the urgent need to legalize undocumented farm workers. Padilla said their arduous and dangerous work keeps Americans fed. An estimated half of the agricultural workforce is made up of undocumented farm workers. Mary Sherman reports that at the hearing, fireworks erupted. Migrant farm workers and an agricultural labor shortage came up in the Senate Wednesday. The Farm Workforce Modernization Act could help to legalize hundreds of thousands of undocumented farmhands. Former United Farm Workers of America President Arturo Rodriguez supports the measure despite compromises. Putting farm workers on a long path to permanent protections, excluding them from access to social safety net programs, and imposing a steep fine for their essential work is not the best way to honor the people who have been breaking their bodies and putting their lives at risk to feed the nation. The hearing got heated when Republican Senator Ted Cruz of Texas pressed Agriculture Secretary Tom Vilsack on border security. I get that you want amnesty. I get that your invitation is come to America, uh, forget the legal processes that everyone... I want a workforce that's going to continue to to support the greatest agriculture and food industry in the world. Vals passed the Farm Workforce Modernization Act in March. I'm Mary Sherman for Pacifica Network and Public News Service. House Speaker Nancy Pelosi pledged the select committee investigating the January 6th Capitol insurrection will go forward. Pelosi spoke a day after she rejected two of the five Republicans House Minority Leader Kevin McCarthy had selected for the committee. And McCarthy responded by pulling back the three others, too. Pelosi refused to go into details about what she called the ridiculous statements made by Ohio's Jim Jordan and Indiana's Jim Banks. She made just a passing reference to a statement she said Banks had made. That the Biden administration was responsible for January 6th. There was no Biden administration on January 6th. But let's not go into that. With respect for the integrity of the investigation... With concern that to that the American people want to know the truth, and in light of statements and actions taken by them, um, I could not appoint them. I said that while this may be unprecedented, so was an attack on the Capitol. I'm not going to spend any more time talking about them. Pelosi denied she refused to seat Banks and Jordan because they voted to overturn Joe Biden's presidential victory hours after the Capitol insurrection. It is unclear whether Pelosi will try to appoint more members to the select panel as she has the authority to do under community, uh, committee rules. She left open that possibility, saying that there are other members who would like to participate. But she said she hadn't decided whether to appoint Illinois Republican Representative Adam Kinzinger, one of only two Republicans who voted in support of creating the panel last month. The other, Wyoming Representative Liz Cheney, has already been appointed by Pelosi to sit on the committee, along with seven Democrats, ensuring that they have a quorum to proceed, whether other Republicans participate or not. Cheney praised Kinzinger, saying he would be a tremendous addition to the panel. Several Democrats on the committee also seemed to support the idea, with Chair Benny Thompson of Mississippi saying the military veteran is the kind of person we'd want to have. You're listening to the Evening News on KPFA in Berkeley, KPFK in Los Angeles, KFCF in Fresno, online at kpfa.org. This is Kat Brooks. I'm an actor, activist, and freedom fighter. And I'm Brian edwards Teekert. I mostly do journalism, which kind of sounds boring now. And together, we host Upfront, 
KPFA's local two-hour morning magazine. We bring you breaking news, debates, deep dives. Reporting on City Hall and the State House. Housing and transportation. Prisons and police. And everything big that happened while you were sleeping. And it means the two of us get to hang out with you at 7 a.m. Right after Democracy Now! on Upfront. And we're still substantially short of our financial goal for this newscast, trying to raise $1,500 as part of this radio station's summer fun drive to keep the radio station on the air, to keep its programming on the air. If you listen to this radio station for its programming, we're asking you to become a listener sponsor to support us financially so we can continue to do this work. If you find yourself hearing voices and points of view outside of the major mainstream media on this radio station, if you're hearing topics discussed that are ignored by other media outlets, we're asking for your financial support. If you're listening in Southern California, please give us a call at 818-985-5735 or go online at KPFK. Dot org and make your contribution. If you are listening in Northern and Central California, give us a call at 1-800-439-5732, 1-800-439-5732, or go to KPFA's website at kpfa.org. As the National Moratorium on Addictions is set to expire at the end of the month, the Center for Budget Policy and Priorities is calling for robust funding for housing choice voucher programs to help the more than 10 million people behind on rent during the pandemic. KPFA's Christina Onestad reports. One in seven renters are behind on their rent, according to Census Bureau data. The latest figures for late June and early July show 7.4 million renters out of 50 million who replied to the latest census survey were behind. For people of color, it's higher. Nearly 25% of African-American respondents said they were behind on rent. With a nationwide eviction moratorium expiring at the end of the month, the Center for Budget and Policy Priorities, CBPP, is calling for robust expansion of housing vouchers. Sharon Parrott is president of the organization. We can invest in policies that reduce hardship and expand opportunity, particularly for those who've historically been left behind, often intentionally. Housing should be a key piece of recovery legislation that seeks to build toward a more equitable future. In particular, recovery legislation should include a significant investment in rental assistance, particularly housing vouchers that are highly effective in helping households afford housing that they choose. The Housing Choice Voucher Program, known as Section 8, pays a portion of rent for low-income families and individuals. It uses a formula that allows recipients to pay between 30 and 40 percent of their income on rent, while the voucher covers the remainder. Parrott says before the pandemic, 11 million households were spending more than 50 percent of their income on rent. She says housing insecurity isn't anything new. It was exacerbated by the pandemic and existing programs were underfunded. When a crisis hits, it is far easier to help people when there are robust existing programs designed to expand when need grows already in place. That wasn't the case in housing, and so getting help to the people who need it has been slower than was necessary in this crisis. Two pieces of legislation would infuse billions of dollars into the Section 8 Housing Choice Voucher Program, a bipartisan bill in the Senate introduced by Maryland Democrat Chris Van Holland and Indiana Republican Todd Young. The Family Stability and Opportunity Vouchers Act would make 500,000 more housing vouchers available over the next five years. In the House, Los Angeles Democrat Maxine Waters this month proposed similar legislation, the Ending Homelessness Act of 2021, to provide 500,000 more housing vouchers each year from 2022 to 2025. It would also make them universal, removing criteria to qualify. 
The need is there. In some jurisdictions, people sign up for the Section 8 program, but can wait for more than eight years before receiving any housing assistance. In California, people wait an average of 32 months before receiving a Section 8 voucher, according to CBPP data. To be clear, any wait at all is too long when you're faced with homelessness or living in an unsafe place. Sonia Acosta, policy analyst for the Center on Budget and Policy Priorities, says the lengthy process can have adverse impacts. Exposing them to homelessness, overcrowding, eviction, and other hardship while they waited. It causes high levels of stress and can make finding and holding a job much more difficult. Homelessness is particularly harmful for children's health, development, and school performance. Waiting several years for stable housing can expose children to hardship through much or all of their early childhood. This can have far-reaching damage on their development and chances of financial or academic success. About half of adults living in homeless shelters reported having a disability, and over three-quarters of people experiencing unsheltered homelessness report having a physical or mental health condition. And CBPP warns with a looming eviction moratorium about to expire, the state of housing and homelessness may only get worse. They're calling on Congress to push forward the legislation in the coming weeks and months ahead. I'm Christina Onestad reporting for KPFA. University of California Regents overwhelmingly today approved a tuition increase for its 10 campus system. 17 to 5 the vote. Beginning next year in the fall of 2022, tuition and fees will rise 2% plus inflation for new undergraduates and then stay flat for those students for up to six years. After 2022, tuition will increase by smaller percentages for each incoming class until the 2026-27 year, when any increase will be based solely on inflation. Any future-related increase is capped at 6% unless the regents vote otherwise. The plan also sets aside 40% of the increases for need-based financial aid. Currently, 33% is set aside for financial aid, Chancellor Cynthia Larive of UC Santa Cruz explains the need for new resources. Let me be clear. I am proud of what my campus has achieved with the resources that we have. I know that every chancellor feels the same. We have worked to fulfill our mission as we have identified inefficiencies and practiced innovative cost cutting. Yet none of us can equitably meet the changing needs of our students, our faculty, our staff, or our state without new resources. Supporters say an increase in financial aid generated by the plan will allow more low-income students to attend UC schools. Tuition has risen, but financial aid has remained flat. UC President Michael Drake cited his experience instituting a similar tuition increase at another university. It was instituted to achieve more predictability for families, which it did, and families appreciated that. It was initiated to be able to have more stable support for the university, for the chancellors, for the deans, for the department chairs, to allow them to build forward. And stable budget really helped them tremendously in being able to do that. It was achieved uh, to provide better cost savings for students. And what we found was that as the years progressed, we had more lower income students admitted, more diverse students admitted, but... Fewer students had debt, and those students who had debt had less debt. So we were able to make the university more affordable while making it more predictable and more diverse. The last tuition hike at UC schools was a 2.7% increase in 2017. Opponents of the move say there's a perpetual tuition increase at UC, calling the new plan the forever hike. Many have questioned the timing of the plan, saying that increasing tuition following a pandemic puts added burden on households that are already struggling. The hike comes as California lawmakers increase the university budget for the UC system by $11 billion this year. Critics are also worried that the increase in tuition will discriminate against poorer out-of-state and international students. Here's departing president of the UC Student Association, Aidan Arassingham. I reflect on what UC has meant to me, an institution I love, but am constantly frustrated by at times. 
a system that opened the door to the California dream for my grandfather, a system that provided an education and lifelong career for my father, and a system that has been my home since I was born into it in 1999, but also a system that in the same time period has gone from being a truly public access institution that was the envy of the world to one that increasingly operates like it's selling a diminishing private product to an increasingly uneager constituency. I know UC can do better because I've seen UC do better, but that always happens when it has chosen daring courage over mediocre predictability. Supporters of the tuition point to the plan's main benefits, stability. Students will know exactly how much they'll be paying each semester of their academic career. Regents in support of the plan also point out that having a reliable income source from increased tuitions will allow for more effective annual budgeting. You see, Regents agreed to reauthorize the tuition plan in five years. California judges cleared the way for conservative talk radio host Larry Elder to join the field of candidates for an upcoming recall election aimed at removing Democratic Governor Gavin Newsom from office. Elder scored a swift court victory in Sacramento where he challenged a decision by a state election officials to block him from the September ballot recall section. Superior Court Judge Lori Earle disagreed with a state decision that Elder failed to meet the requirement to run in the election. Under a new requirement, candidates for California governor must publicly release tax returns for the five most recent years to qualify for the ballot, but the judge determined the rule did not apply to recall elections, and even if it did, Elder had substantially complied the Biden administration announced new sanctions today against a Cuban official and a government special brigade that it says was involved in human rights abuses during a government crackdown on protests on the island earlier this month. The Treasury Department's Office of Foreign Assets Control listed Alvaro Lopez Miera, a Cuban military and political leader, and the Interior Ministry's Special Brigade as among those who will face the latest sanctions. According to Treasury, Cuba's Ministry of the Revolutionary Armed Forces, which is led by Lopez Miera and other Cuban government security services, have attacked protesters and arrested or disappeared over a hundred of them in an attempt to suppress the protests. Carolyn Malone reports. The White House says Cuba's Defense Minister Alvaro Lopez Miera and the Buenas Negras, an elite unit named after their distinctive headgear, are leading a crackdown on anti-government protesters. Thousands of people marched in cities across Cuba earlier this month, chanting Libertad or Freedom and demanding the resignation of the country's president, Miguel Diaz-Canal. He's blamed the unrest and Cuba's economic problems on the ongoing U.S. trade embargo. The Biden administration has been reviewing its Cuba policy in recent months, but the crackdown on protesters is forcing it to take a tougher line. Caroline Malone reporting from Washington. Well, have you got 560 extra dollars? Have you got 560 dollars just burning a hole in your pocket? That's how far short we are for the news hour tonight in raising money to keep this newscast on the air and to keep the radio stations upon which it airs, KPFK in Los Angeles, KFCF in Fresno, and KPFA in Berkeley, to keep those radio stations on the air. $560 were short, and we have just over one minute and 15 seconds left for someone to rummage around in your divan or your sofa, in your couch, and see if there's $560 worth of spare change down there, give us a call. Southern California, 818-985-5735, or go online, kpfk.org, or give us a call in Northern and Central California, 1-800-439-5732. Just $560 of spare change. Or kpfa.org. Mostly sunny tomorrow in the San Francisco Bay Area with highs in the upper 60s around the bay, but getting hot in the inland valleys with a predicted high in the mid-90s tomorrow under sunny skies. Sunny and continued hot in the central San Joaquin Valley. 
Predicted high of 103 degrees tomorrow. Mostly sunny in Los Angeles tomorrow with highs in the mid-80s. That's it for the news tonight for this Thursday, July 22nd. Thanks for listening. I'm Mark Miracle. Good evening. Tune in Thursday nights starting at 7 p.m. for Apex Express, a weekly magazine-style radio show featuring the voices and stories of Asians and Asian Americans from all corners of their communities. Then at 8, it's a unique mix of singer, songwriter, folk, rock, soul, country, and R&B on The Bonnie Simmons Show. Finally, at 10 p.m., The Here and Now with Dirk Richardson, bringing you a mix of singer-songwriters to avant-garde jazz, old faves, new voices, and live performances. That's Thursday nights on 94.1 KPFA and kpfa.org. You're listening to 94.1 KPFA, 89.3 KPFB in Berkeley, 88.1 KFCF in Fresno, 97.5 K248BR in Santa Cruz and online worldwide at kpfa.org.